YouTube any minute now. Let's take a quick little check. Going to Twitch is the scariest thing because it doesn't matter what you do, but the second you get there, some sound is like, <laughs> and I have no idea what the sounds are half the time, which is a lot of fun. <laughs> okay, so I think we are live. Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome. Good to see everybody. I know it's been a little bit of a minute since we've had a live stream situation, and we're happy to start doing more of these again. And let me just make sure my chat is working here. Hello to everybody in the chat. Um, and we're going to get started a little bit, you know, I would say calmly compared to normal. Uh, we're going to go around and introduce this lovely panel of folks we have with us here in a moment. Um, but by all means, everyone who's here watching, say hello in the chat. We'll be getting started in about a minute here. And I guess... You know, you'd think by this point in, in the career, I would have, and it's funny because we have such a big Google Doc that we're looking at, and I, I don't have any notes about what I'm supposed to say. So, so I, it's all, you know, it's a, welcome. I'm just going to say welcome like a hundred times and we'll, we'll be really good. We'll be really good. Um, but with that said, I think we can dive right in. So thanks everybody for joining us. I'm Elbers. Uh, I'm the co-founder of the Interactive and Immersive HQ, which if you haven't heard of before, I have no idea how you got here. So, but I like it. So like stay, you know, get comfortable. Uh, you'll, you'll learn more about the HQ later. Uh, you got our YouTube channel, our Twitch, you know, do the subscribe buttons and the hearts and like, you know, whatever the buttons are called that everyone tells you to smash like a hundred times in every video. Like do, 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 just pretend like I'm saying the same thing. Um, but with that said, we have a very special session today. We've got four amazingly talented um, visual artists, developers, architects, economy. We got the whole, like the whole mix of creative talent, um, and all of these talents kind of came together for the recent Sat Festival, which was an amazing kind of full dome festival featuring a lot of artists uh, locally as well as international artists. And if you haven't been to the Sat, which is in Montreal. Really cool place. I highly recommend going. Um, I remember the first time I went there was for Mutech, ooh, 2014, 2015. Uh, and it was a really cool experience just to see, you know, it almost feels like the headquarters, it, it, which is, uh, you know, because we're the HQ, but this feels like a, an in-person HQ for all things that are kind of interactive, immersive, you know, they got the dome, they have a lot of workshops and courses. So it's just like a really cool place. If you haven't been to the Sat in Montreal, highly uh, suggest checking it out. But all of these lovely artists were part of the Sat Fest, which is a full dome festival. And and, and by all means, and it, I know I, I haven't officially introduced you guys yet, so it'd be kind of like weird if you <laughs> say something. But if, if I say the process incorrectly, by all means, let me know. So, you know, everyone from all over the world submitted their kind of dome artworks that they wanted to put into this festival. And of yep. all of those kind of artworks, you know, a handful were selected for that sat fest and kind of played kind of like a, a little mini film festival, which is, uh, sounds amazing. And then many of our panelists here are the award winners from the festival, which is even cooler. So with that said, I think I would be amiss if I didn't start introducing some of our lovely, lovely panelists. So and now I'm going to go in the order in, that I have in Zoom just because... Um, I took a nap earlier, so my brain cells are still kind of like, I need, I need a way to keep track of, of who's being introduced. So, uh, May Sam, my friend, uh, please feel free to introduce yourself and let the people know kind of your background and, and what you're about. Thank you, Alborz. Um, hi, everyone. Hope you're doing great. And uh, I'm an audiovisual artist from Quebec, and uh, I'm an engineer, uh, also uh, kind of relates to what I do. Like in terms of processes and uh yeah i've been i've been working with the dome content for a few years now uh, so um i'm as i'm certified by sat by the place just i was just explaining montreal i attended the workshop um a few years back in 360 full dome creation so i'm certified by them I've learned a lot of stuff there and later I took the approach um, that I've learned there and combining it with the learning material, uh, mostly touch designer uh, to, to find my workflow and everything. So yeah, that's that. I'm working on a lot of pieces for the 360 and immersive environments uh, 
um, kind of work. And uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's awesome. And what I'm going to do is as we're kind of introducing all the panelists, I'm going to in the chat put their uh, Instagram links, social media links. So let me tell you, if you're going to see some really cool stuff today, and I think you should follow everybody, all their socials. It's the right thing to do in life. Okay. So uh, thank you, Mason, for your introduction. And what we're going to do is after we introduce everybody, we're going to go through and actually watch the trailers of their sat fast pieces before we dive into kind of our artistic conversation here. So uh, next up, Sebastian, my friend, would you like to uh, introduce yourself? Yes, sure. Uh, thank you for organizing this. This panel is pretty cool. And thanks, Mesam, also for the initiative, I guess. Yeah, it was, uh, it was nice to meet you in set. Uh, nice to meet Lydia also. So I'm really happy to be here. And it was an, an amazing festival. Uh, so my name is Sebastian. I'm a French uh, visual artist uh, living in Canada right now. And uh, it's been, I used to do graphic design, uh, video games. And now it's been like three to three years, four years. I'm doing more immersive work. Uh, mainly also 3D reconstruction, which is quite linked to my um, my artistic approach uh, using point clouds and, and all, all these techniques. And um, and it was really, really awesome to be at SatFest because it was the first time actually I, I went there. I wasn't able to, to go in 2020. I had another piece selected in 2020, but it was uh, too far <laughs> so, and too short. And it was quite intense, like this week, like 40 films in a week. So that was really, really amazing. And uh, yeah, I look forward for the next one. And uh, yeah, super happy to be here. It's our pleasure. It's our pleasure. I, I, we're going to have a lot of fun today. And we were already like, even before we started, we were just laughing about like everything and having a good time. <laughs> so um, I also put Sebastian's links in the chat. So make sure to follow. Uh, next up, Lydia, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, thank you for having me. Um, so I am uh, actually an economist, uh, but with a visual arts uh, background, I studied visual arts. And so I absolutely love everything that is geometrical, mathematical. So this is why I got into um, generative, generative visuals with touch designers. So that's really what drives my, my creative work. So yeah, so I, tr I love combining both um, the creation uh, with visual arts and also the very, the, the modelizations and economics. I try to, to combine both in my, in my works. And I think we're going to see that in the, the preview of your SAF SP. It's really cool. Like, I, I was really into it. So thanks. Um, thanks for joining us. It's, it's a pleasure. And then last but certainly not least, our friend Sergey. How are you, my friend? Uh, thank you. Uh, 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 it's a pleasure to be here. And thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'm architect from Berlin, and we are in disciplinary a uh, small studio that uh, our uh, experimental work of our studio is somewhere in intersection between architectural design, urban planning, immersive storytelling, and new type of mobility. And um, I'm very uh, exciting to explore new way of architectural communication tool and through immersive video. And um, I truly believe that a full dome format it's the most intensive, has the most intensive visual impression for architectural representation. And I'm glad to share uh, and uh, to talk about this today. That's amazing. Thanks for joining us. And, and you're joining us from, uh, from Berlin. Berlin. Which is, it's a little bit almost in the evening. So thanks for also, uh, you know, accommodating. Thank you so much. So with that said, we kind of have are learning a little bit about our fantastic artists. And I think the best way to keep learning about them is to watch the trailers for everybody's piece. And I thought it would be really interesting as we're kind of just kind of blasting through watching these is if each one of us kind of gives a, maybe a few sentences of context about the piece and then we'll go into watching it. So I think in the same order that we did the introductions, uh, Mesa and my friend, do you want to tell people about growth a little bit and kind of, you know, what the main idea behind it was? Yeah, for sure. Um... Basically, I was back in school. Uh, I was doing my MBA. Um, there was a in we had a we had a course, uh, in strategy and business. And uh, one of the main questions uh, relates to the business, and I think it relates to everything. Uh, we can apply to to all types of different contexts. Is a uh, idea of growth. Uh, so, is um, it's always a question if the business should grow 
meaning uh, horizontally or vertically or in depth, you know, just adding more to the to the products that it has and offering more, you know, or expanding that way, or it, it adds to the experience to stay local, but gain more experience, you know, being more profound. So that's always something, but uh, this was in the back of my mind for, uh, for a good few years. Uh, um, I was doing like the Instagram posts uh, for our uh, social media, and there was one, one idea of growth uh, that I did. It was in the context of full dome, and uh, it was about the growth. And there was the question that uh, at the end it asks that, is the growth an inevitable path or a decision that you make? Um, based on my understanding and what I like to, <laughs> you know, the way how I like, I like to answer this question is that the growth is an inevitable, um, you know, principle in our life. So you cannot kind of not grow. That's that's the main idea. But um, the point is, like usually in the, in the works that I'm doing, I keep the idea mostly for myself um, or for, uh, within our team. So we stay consistent and we won't deviate from the main idea. Uh, it, it's not necessarily there to be conveyed to the audience. But at the end of this piece, uh, oh, I created uh, several universes uh, transitioning into each other. You know, in, in all of them, there's some kind of growth is happening. And at the end, it asks the, asks the audience uh, a growth, a decision, or an individual path. So that was the main idea behind it. I, I didn't want to force it too much. I wanted to kind of keep it abstract. And uh, for that, I really, uh, you know, like in terms of colors and number of scenes, as I, I try to stay, like keep it simple, not too complicated, not too many informations and everything. So that was the whole idea behind uh, behind growth. That's amazing. And I like I like the kind of question, is it inevitable or not? Yeah. Is it a decision? <laughs> so let me share my screen here. I have it pulled up. And what I'm going to do is I'm also going to post the links of these in the chat because, you know, listen, this is, this is Zoom. We all know Zoom by now. <laughs> it works, but, you know, the quality might get a little bit, you know, fuzzier on the edge. So what I recommend highly is, you know, we'll put it up here. You're going to hear it. You're going to see it. But I also highly recommend take these links put them on your nice monitor, put it on your nice speakers, really kind of experience them because all these pieces are, are very, very cool. So let me put the link here in the chat for you. And then let me share my screen here. And let's look at growth. Oh, oh you know what, no, hold on, I gotta hit, there's an extra button on the share screen I have to hit to optimize video clip, yeah. Now we have technology. Okay, so here we go. Awesome, so cool. I, I really vibe out, I vibe. I mean, I vibe out to all of the pieces, so I, I, we're very lucky to have such cool artists. So thank you, Mason, that's, that's amazing. And, and we're gonna dive into kind of more the artistic inspirations behind all these pieces after we kind of get through um, watching everybody's and, and kind of getting a little taste, a little uh, amuse-bouche, as we might say en français, if, if I got some, I see a lot of French friends in the chat. So uh, I guess next we'll go to Sebastian. If you want to tell us a little bit about your piece, and then uh, we can dive in. And I, I okay, so can I try and say the name, Jacinth, X Y Z? You can try. Did I do it? Yeah, you did. Or was that a try? Yeah, actually, <laughs> when I when I picked the name, I was in my in my in my head, it was more like Jacinth dot X Y Z, but in French, it's mm -hmm. it sounds 
not as not as nice. It's like hyacinth. Yeah. I can't say it in English, but uh, so yeah. And I like to use French word for my my tempo. I try to keep it French sometimes. Yeah. And yeah, so the idea uh, of this one, um, it was also I like to work with constraints sometimes. So so this one, I it was I was I was trying to mix like just using one subject um, for the piece and also using um, be to work equally with the, the, the musician. So it was uh, built on live sessions. Um, so I've done, a, so yeah, it's, it's a flower, like a, a group of flower I had in, back in France in Vernon. It was just a simple subject. Uh, one of the many scans I have in, in folders, but um, I really liked the color balance of those one. And, and it was, yeah, I remember I have like some uh, good memories with those, these flowers. So, mm. and I say, okay, let's, let's start with just one subject, a simple one, and and see uh, um, how far I can go if I can do like four to five minutes uh, with just one piece and 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 try different different visual rhythm and and, and expand morph and can I do also a, a little narrative with this simple subject? So so that's that's what I I try to do with this piece. And so I've done a, a first live uh, improvisation. Like with the MIDI controller and everything, I, I to modulate uh, the scan in in touch, um, just capturing, doing doing an export and everything, and I send to my uh, send it to my musician friend uh, uh, Clément Putenia, uh, who, who is a really talented clarinet, clarinetist and multi multi instrument player, and and he improvised on this piece. So the constraint was also to just do one session. Don't don't do ten oh, wow, tries. No yeah, just one session for the audio part, and then he sent me back the audio. So my visual was like I was trying to implement uh, narrative parts live. So it's uh, you need to know your patch and 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 MIDI control, which is quite fun. And um, and then he sent me the audio, and then I've done a, a new a new live session with the visual uh, using his audio uh, directly, and that's the final mm. uh, that's the final output. Um, and then I, I've done some after effects for pixel sorting and and post processing a tiny bit, but uh, the, the main there is no cuts or edit on the final final piece. So that That's amazing, and I love that idea of that kind of live performance to recording to another performance to final like a, that feels really kind of natural. Yeah, and and I'm I'm not uh, like C4D guy too much. I don't I don't want to wait for. You'd you and me anything. both. You and me both. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> but still, that like, after effect is pretty long. Mm. Yeah, at the end, yeah, it was the, the main idea. Yeah, simplicity at the core, like a, a single subject, expand on it, and the live session aspect. Also. Amazing. So let's take a look, and I put the link in the chat for folks uh, to also watch this if you want to watch this on your home system. Uh, let me share the screen here. I have a full version somewhere on YouTube, maybe a private link I can, oh, yeah. can share later. Oh, that'd be awesome. Yeah, we can put that one up uh, after the trailer. All right. Amazing, super. You know what? That that one's one of those ones. You know where you like get self conscious of your breathing. You know, like, am I breathing too loud? Like that's that's <laughs> that's kind of the power of of that kind of piece, and that, that's amazing. And and so that one, your piece won the audience award. So congratulations, that's amazing. Thanks. Yeah, that was really nice. And uh, and yeah, I, w I wanted to keep it soft and the clarinet, like just yeah. yeah, I wanted to keep it really really soft and chill. <laughs> And I'm so excited to dive into a little bit more of the technical and artistic stuff of all these. But so let, let's keep it rolling. Let's keep it rolling. Lydia, 
Um, what would you kind of say about your piece? Because I know there's a lot of background in your piece, which is really cool. Yeah, um, for my piece, I really wanted to do an, an artistic representation of economic modeling. So all the data points, the graphs, the no, really just the visuals of economic modeling, not trying to symbolize anything. Just, you know, I've been studying economics like 20 years ago, I've, I've tried to represent it with, with different media. I tried to paint it, paint. I tried to, to uh, do prints, but I find that the, the video was the best way of trying to represent it. So this piece was my first attempt of, of trying to represent um, uh, worlds where you, you you go around floating data points where the graphs are the graphs of the economic uh, theory they're they're flat but then they start moving around and they get they get free and you have you have such um you have like a graph that's that's floating around and trying to walk around data points and it's, it becomes like a dance of of, of modelization i know it sounds sounds funny but mm. i really wanted it to to be some kind of um a, a dreamlike state where you just float around the different uh, data points. It's amazing. Uh, and I almost feel like if, who you know, teenage engineering, the OP1 people, I yeah. feel like in their wildest dreams, they wanted to have it look like this, but it doesn't look <laughs> as good as this. That That's kind of how I feel about it. So let me share my screen and we can watch uh, Lydia's piece. Uh, okay, share screen. Oh, and I, do you want me, can I try saying the title in French? Because, you know, I love... Oh, yeah. Go, go so ahead. So this is Introduction à l'économétrie. Perfect. <laughs> not bad, right? Not bad? Yeah, great. Yeah, I, not bad, not bad. Okay. So let, me, let me full screen it again. I, in my excitement, I unfull screened it, but now I'm going to full screen it again. <laughs> That's awesome. Then that one feels like it would be such an interesting experience in the dome. Uh, it was I, I mean, all of them are yeah, amazing, amazing. And and we have uh, Vince is asking in the chat how many hours I practice that in front of the mirror. More than once is what I'll say. That's <laughs> I won't reveal the true answer, but it's more more than once. <laughs> Okay, so our final piece to look at. And so, uh, Leah, you won the Campus Sat Special Mention Award, so congratulations about that. That's amazing. And then our final piece here, Sergey, do you want to talk a little bit about Labyrinth? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, uh, basically, uh, I submit two movies, was Suprematism and Labyrinth won the, the, the prize, basically. And uh, the labyrinth, it was an uh, idea to um, get the feeling uh, of walking through the space. Because when we have view from above, uh, we, we have a kind of, a, uh, we see as a, this is as a plan or as a drawing or as a line. But when we get really inside of the labyrinth, we switch to another perception of space. We're switching to a, a subject, subjective uh, perception of life and uh, the labyrinth it's urging people to walk through all the time we have to all time moving through the labyrinth and we consistently affected by numerous different images perspective that affect us and the main idea of labyrinth uh, get lost never get exit from the labyrinth mm. and um in the in um, festival was short version of it at eight eight minutes, but the mm -hmm. longest version or original seventeen minutes that, that mm -hmm. people oh, can spend in black and white uh, environment, and basically story just uh, or the, you can see the labyrinth by a uh, small piece of light that uh, highlight uh, architectural mm -hmm. elements. Amazing. So let me dive in here and play the trailer for it.
it's so cool. I mean, the aesthetics, I mean, you know, in, uh, so more. in an industry where monochrome aesthetics, everyone does it, and it, you find one like this where it's like that, yeah, that's cool. Uh, so congratulations on that. that that's an amazing thing. And you won the Excellence Award for, for Labyrinth, so that's amazing. Congratulations, congratulations. Um, now, one thing I'm going to put in the chat here is the full piece to Sebastian's piece. So if you want to watch the full thing, and by all means, if, if all of our artists here, if you want to send me the full pieces or other kind of things, we can, we'll can we'll just keep tossing links in the chat and everyone is going to have a very full Dome Friday. Can we make that happen? Hashtag full Dome Friday? Is that, <laughs> are we starting a new movement here? Full Dome Friday. So we French fries, full Dome Friday. French fries fold on Friday. Oh, now we're starting to combine some really good things that I like. <laughs> so I think a great place that we can dive in is, is we kind of heard a little bit about everyone's kind of inspiration about what their piece's meaning is. Um, and I kind of, you know, we have a list, all kinds of questions listed here, but I think one of the, the most interesting questions for me is, you know, how do you all find there's a difference between working in a full dome environment versus working on a different medium, maybe like a set of screens or an LED wall or an architectural piece. And Sergey, I want to start with you because you kind of were telling us earlier that you really found that domes are, feel like that most immersive medium for you. Yeah, no, exactly. Because um, as I said before, or like people before when, uh, and uh, that, uh, we open new world of Unreal Engine as architects. Mm -hmm. And uh, before was representation of architectural story just in two dimensional, in, in, just in flat pieces on, on paper, on plan and section. And now with the new technology, we are able to bring viewers really inside of our project. But why we are interested in full dome format, because it's a collective experience. And our existing uh, physical, uh, we exist in the physical world, and we it's, it's personal my uh, thinking that I'm not really comfortable wearing the VR glasses, and I don't see who is around me or like I don't see I isolated from my body. But in a dome, you can share emotion. You are physical. Uh, you physically presented there, and it's new uh, architectural room. It's very digital, where physical world melted together with the digital. And you have a shared experience with the other people who are uh, have like watching the movie or uh, have an interaction with mm -hmm. you. You can talk with people. You are kind of really in physically in virtual space. And I think that's a really interesting idea, this, this idea of you know, the, the dome is kind of like VR without having to be stuck in the glasses. And, and Mesa, I think this is something you were telling me about before, where that idea of that kind of public shared experience was kind of really important to you. Do you find that's like the biggest difference you find between a dome and other mediums? Yeah, definitely. It's um, it's the, it's a very basic concept that, uh, with regards to dome, you know, like uh, you just imagine yourself outside, you're outside of your studio, outside of your home. Uh, you can imagine yourself being in the middle of a sphere all the time but uh half of that sphere is basically underground so you don't have a view of it so basically you're in the center of a semi-sphere if, if you imagine like like that like in whatever situation you are in your room outside so dome actually gives you like the screen like that so it kind of resembles the real life so you can mm. you can look in all directions and that's why that the, the sense of spatial spatial um, you know, it, it's so important in, in the dome, like uh, thinking peripheral, it's, uh, it's, it's very crucial when, when it comes to the dome. So, uh, but at the same time, there is a, in comparison with, with other mediums, you know, like in the dome, one thing that I really like to think about is that finding that sweet spot of the, of the screen, because the screen is huge. So it's, mm. it's not the case that you all the time you can, you can capture with your eyes, all of the screen. You know, so you, you have to kind of plan and strategize where you want to put the main and most important parts of your content on the screen, where you want to project them. And this, these are some cool stuff, um, you know, like um, well, compared to other mediums, maybe the, the, the position or the location of the things are not that crucial. 
-hmm. it is of course it, it depends on the storytelling but for the dome it's really important uh so i really find i like that also the I like the the axis of z when it comes to dome prediction it really it it, it gains like like very significant uh, you know like the uh, it's uh it's such important thing important thing to think about you know like in terms of z i wanna i wanna uh you know kind of you you move uh, through you move your camera through the scene through the universes and uh um you know it, it's it really adds to the adds to the weight of that artistic piece yeah and i guess it's really interesting just even that idea that it is this kind of semi-sphere and how much that affects the ability to feel like you're going through, you know, a tunnel or through a 3D space. Uh, I think that's that's a really kind of like powerful concept. And Lydia, I wanted to ask you because you coming from, you know, the economics background, you probably have different mediums where you can even express the kind of information that inspires you for your work. So a little bit of a, a, two questions is how do you find the dome versus um, a lot? Because I also know you do VJ work. How do you find that comparison? But also, how do you find the comparison between how you might represent some of your data even outside of our industry? Like, I hate to say the E word on a Friday Excel, but, you know, you know how, how do you find that kind of bridge in your mind getting crossed? Yeah, exactly. So, uh, yeah, I've been VGing since 2010, so I have a lot of experience of projecting on flat screens and trying to portray um, a visual experience to the music. So with the dome, I find that it this it goes in another direction even more. It's um, the, the, the emotion that you get with the images that fit with the music, they're multiplied. I find them multiplied um, because it's so immersive and it, you can give really an illusion to the person that not only they're listening to music, they're seeing images that are moving to the music, but they're in they're living in another world. They're 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 floating into space. Like in, for example, in my movie, you, you're floating around data points, and it gives you a, an emotional uh, a level that you don't get on the flat screen. So I loved uh, having the experience of being a VJ, but applying it in a, such an immersion immersive uh, um, format, it, it just elevated it uh, even more. Mm. And um, to what was your second question about Excel? I just no, heard Excel. It was really, and, I, <laughs> and then yeah, I know you heard Excel and you're like, ah, no, not today, not today. No, that's 100%. No, I, I'm sorry I said the E word on a Friday. Oh, okay. but, um, I love Excel. Yeah. <laughs> Do you, I, you know, I secretly, I always tell everybody like Google Sheets is, and Excel is where I spend like most of my time. But yeah. the question was a little bit, you know, even comparing the idea of visual mediums for you coming from different data mediums, you know, there's, you can express your kind of data in an Excel, you could probably express it in 2D graphs and charts, and then to kind of cross that bridge and bring it over. And you were telling us a little bit earlier, um, you know, you had tried painting even at one point to try and express this kind of data. So how does that, how was that kind of experience for you going from something like Excel or just databases into these different artistic mediums and then now into this kind of dome space? Well, I think it went naturally when I started experiencing, experimenting with a, a generative visuals, because it's a very, just a very mathematical uh, way of creating generative visuals that resembles a bit working in economics. So it, I didn't try to visualize economics when I started doing visuals, um, but then it kind of came together and I, I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, there's a lot of different um, explorations of data sets and uh, point clouds and everything, but I wanted to do a really a visual and uh, like a dream kind of state, a uh, visual representation, almost psychedelic visuals of uh, just data points in economics. And it's like, the movie is like, opening an econometrics book, but it, you're not seeing what you would suppose you're supposed to see. It's not as boring as just opening the book. It's just trying to, to make you feel just like you're floating around data points, which we all mm. are in fact sold. So it's, the bridge was made really by the, the mediums, but then the, the, the type of, of, um, of data that just came together and, and created this movie. That's awesome. And I find those kind of natural progressions are always so interesting. They never take the path that you think they're going to take, which is, which is always a lot of fun for them. Um, now, Sebastian, I know because you also have a very interesting background coming through so many different mediums 
and working yeah. through kind of a, I would almost say that, you know, in some worlds, they might be different industries. And how do you find the comparison between all of those kind of different mediums? You know, now you're working on like the archaeology side of things you were saying, you know, and comparing all of those over to a dome. Like, how does that kind of feel for you in terms of mediums? Um, so it's one of, one of the other format, like immersive format available. But yeah, comparing to many, I mean, so many years in uh, doing VR things, I was really into mm -hmm. VR. I was like preaching VR. I was super, super fun of VR. And then I got a bit, uh, like like Sergey say, like I got a bit bored by the cutting yourself from the world. You can do crazy things. Like you can really immerse your, yourself, but you're alone. And uh, that's not... Um, that, that's not as um, as a, uh, a human experience as like an immersive space with like maybe like three walls, one floor, or like a like a cube cube setup. And the dome has um, it always remind me. I'm I'm really like a like a child when I go into a dome, see my piece or other piece. It reminds me like early days of planetarium, like going through planets and and and, and such. And and it's it's really like you're you're inside a cocoon, and it's it's not a movie theater, and it's not an exhibition space. It's a bit in, in between, and um, and and yet comparing to to VR, it's uh, it's it's not as difficult to set up the the focus point for for narrative. They all have like different oh. sweet spots. Yeah, but basically, the the tilt. Um, there is like still a sweet spot when you you want to guide like the audience uh, look. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, but I, I approached like the dome, uh, my first piece in 2020, it was really like about the Z axis, like Mesam said also, like it was really like you, you flow into a, a breach of light and, and, and you have like this final, like explosion kind of, of like a, inside an atom or something. And with this piece, it, it was more, um, uh, like cherishing the shell of the dome, like the, the surface and, 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 and having like. A little sense of of depth, but uh, mostly like playing with the uh, actual surface of the dome. Um, yeah, because your so... piece was so colorful and like just really kind of almost meditative in the sense that it felt like there was motion and color. But to your point, it wasn't like let's you know fly down the Tron Tunnel uh, type yeah, of yeah. experience. And so that was something that you just kind of changed based on you had done one of those before and you wanted to be a little bit more. Kind of try yeah. something different this time. Yeah, I wanted to try something different, and uh, but inside the dome, I also wished I had done more the axis at the end. But it's it was it was still uh, was still fine, and uh, I wanted to do a, like a live painting uh, kind of project, so it it fits mm. uh, the subject. Um, but yeah, dome are are really uh, a really really amazing canvas, and and actually it's it's easier to for example to work on. A, when you get used to it, or if you if you have tricks to to preview, like a like a inverted sphere um, in any 3D software, you can export your video and, and send it to VR and have a preview of your dome. It, it's quite useful to to see what works and what doesn't work, and it's more easy to export for full dome than let's say like three walls with weird shapes and a floor like for specific setups. It's more easy for artists to it's a, yeah it's more easy. The pipeline is a bit easier than. In That's interesting. It, it might be one of the few areas where the curve is easier than the not curve. Because <laughs> yes. everywhere else in the digital world, like a curve is like, oh, no, oh, gosh, we have to deal with the curve. <laughs> in this case, like, oh, great, like the curve oh, is way easier than <laughs> if it was flat walls. Um, so I think that's a really interesting kind of kind of perspective. And uh, Sergey, coming back to you, you know, one of the things that I find really interesting, and we've kind of all been talking a little bit about it, is this idea of like inspiration that you've all had coming into the dome space and you know it, it's an interesting one for me to think about because it, it almost seems like every other medium has this very publicly aware catalog of oh we know you know Rafik and adult artists we know Zach Lieberman's we know these people we know people that work on flat surfaces um, but it almost feels like we don't hear a lot about really great dome artists so I was curious and it's almost a little bit of two-part question which is a it seems to be a trend that I have as two-part questions. The first is, you know, are there some really um, inspirational artists that kind of helped shape your vision a little bit about working with domes? And then do you find it's a little bit harder to be inspired in a dome? And is it more experimentation than inspiration per se? 
Um, I think it's for me, it's more process. Yeah, um, I would uh, about first question about uh, inspiration. I'm not really uh, know well uh, 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 artistic world because I'm more from architectural world. And uh, I had my favorite some old architects or like of old buildings that I want to also uh, uh, had experience to walk through and maybe it would be mm -hmm. idea for a next movie to replicate some dozen existing building and about uh, uh, in uh, process yeah that I, I think um, it's also my personal feeling that I more like to produce than to have it final result I very uh, like in, I enjoy the process of set up the camera. We working with a dynamic camera, and to uh, in a dome, uh, we can test the movement of it. We can test the speed, and most enjoyable part when you have already some design, and to uh, make life of the, this path to uh, create some personal experience really along mm -hmm. the right way and uh we try to make uh with movie or uh, like mm, interaction without any breaks without any cuts to not uh distract and have a seamless um, story seamless mm -hmm. connection but for me it's yeah i totally have uh, like the process of creation and i think that's an interesting we'll i think we'll come to this when we start talking more about like a technical side of things because we saw your dome which was very cool with the uh, with the low resolution of 3k it was the running joke earlier uh but i feel like that is almost connected to this idea of the process being so important that you know you were like oh you know what we need to have a dome here that we can kind of just iterate a lot and try things and experiment and and even just make that part of our process like do you find that that love of diving into the process is what made you get the dome or was it that you just ha you happened to get a dome for some other reason and then you started to love the process of working with it uh, uh hard to say but i think we we, we get this dome because it's we focusing on three stuff it's a space creation that very uh, important to be really in space interactive space design and we're using mm -hmm. the dome for space presentation that uh, we can share our experience or we can teach people how to behave in our uh, design environment or urban environment what we want to next step how we can use want to use dome for to understand better what is the personal space perception and here we want to collaborate with different institution Mm -hmm. And this our three reasons why we get the dome in our studio. It's uh, space creation, space presentation, and space uh, uh, learn about perception of space. Mm. I mean, that's, that, those are three very kind of almost such foundational pillars of successful art practice. I mean, successful business in a lot of ways. Like, it, it just seems like such a really rich... I'm, you know, because sometimes people say, I bought this piece of equipment because... Of this reason and i'm like oh, okay that reason is like that's okay reason like <laughs> that's a cool no, reason. The, but these reasons have... sound very real these reasons sound really actually amazing i just want to say like, each city mm -hmm. has a planetarium and it's i think it's great for, for like a platform for communication mm -hmm. uh, in this is in disciplinary communication where architects uh, scientists artists can meet together and uh, share with the uh, uh, citizens and discuss it that's why it's a physical digital and a collective yeah that's an interesting one i i wonder if like and if we have any planetarium owners in the chat yeah let us know because we have many beautiful artists who would love to use your planetarium i think that would be a, a fun uh, a fun exercise so um and coming to you may sam you know from your perspective of inspiration both in terms of you know the growth piece but also um, talking about kind of dome inspiration in particular, you know, how do you find that experience for you? Um, basically, you know, like um, having a sense of space uh, of a full dome theater already. Um, you when you when you go online, see tutorials, you know, like see uh, your peers work and everything. 
you kind of get a, you know, like in, in, in your mind, you can apply every con everything that you see to the dorm contents and kind of, you know, like uh, examine it, examine it to see how it works in the dorm. Yeah. Is it going to look cool or is it because like, honestly, not every content works well in the dorm. Um, I remember when I was doing the workshop um, in SAT, one thing that we learned was, you know, this idea of points or uh, somehow I elaborate on, and it's gonna be repetition, you know, this kind of ideas, you know, that, that you have something in, in and you have a lot of instances. Um, this kind of idea works well in the dome, but uh, it's uh, more, you, you see a lot of work, you kind of find that, okay, it's becoming sort of a cliche, but not not fully. So that's mm -hmm. the, where um, I refer to what Sergey said about like personalizing that, that path and, you know, like finding it. Uh, for me, I've seen great pieces inside the dome, like all the all the artists here in this panel, of course. But before that, there is a link. To, um, I already yeah, I'll post that in the chat yeah. for everybody. Um, it's it's for Ran San Jose uh, work, uh, which is uh, uh, you know like the touch designers people. <laughs> they all know him. Like uh, he's such a great artist, and he did this piece uh, named Creatures uh, a few years back inside the dome in in Sat in Montreal. I always, you know, like go and look at that piece whenever I want to want to be inspired or something. Um, other stuff is that you know some kind of architectural stuff, um, you know, like the like the domes in in um, ancient domes. You can see the structure, and yeah. you know, like like Persian domes. Uh, you you go inside and you see the design exactly. The eyebrows, <laughs> mustache. I yeah. found a Persian dome. There it is. <laughs> so basically, that's the idea to to just uh, uh, kind of you know like get inspired, not necessarily wanting to replicate those ideas, mm -hmm. but kind of feeling your engine, seeing what is possible uh, to do inside the dome. Also, um, I have a partner. Uh, his name is Farshad. He's uh, from uh, from Germany, and. Uh, he, he's a he's a sound engineer music producer we always talk together you know like we spend a lot of time just talking together about different ideas you know what what works well inside of them what doesn't and this kind of you know spatial thinking yeah uh, i think it really helps me also uh i want to add like a group coaching calls uh, that's for elbor's uh, platform for uh, hq pro uh, like uh it's uh it's like there are like two calls each month, uh, every other week. Uh, so we get together and uh, it's so fun. Usually you get very amazing ideas from different artists and diff developers that are really working in the field. They are not necessarily like doing producers, but mm -hmm. you can, the, the, the concept is always applicable to your dome. You test it in your mind or, or like Sergey, if you have a, like, a, like a dome yourself in your studio, you test the idea see if it works or not and then yeah you can come up with a with a perfect recipe for your for your piece yeah that's beautiful and i think this it seems like this common thread between all of us is that you are pulling a lot of inspiration from things that aren't specifically just dome content and i wonder if that's kind of one of the reasons why and maybe this is my experience and, and i'll kind of open this up just a little bit before we jump to lydia but it feels like the dome content, you know, niche has so much diversity. I feel like, you know, if you go and look at like artists doing uh, festivals or artists doing more flat canvas work, there's a little bit more homogenization between their works because maybe there is such a rich kind of inspirational path that people come through. And maybe it's because of this idea of dome, like all four of your pieces were completely, <laughs> completely, like with almost nothing in common between your four pieces. And, you know, there was 40 pieces at the Sat Fest, and I'm sure there was like a huge diversity of content, like, um, you know, and just kind of open this up. Do, do you guys feel the same way that that uh, dome works seem to have a little bit more variety in them, maybe because everyone's pulling out inspiration from different places? Yeah, I think that's uh, that's definitely true. Um, and uh yeah, it's um, there. Just so so much potential um, mm -hmm. that you can harvest, uh, you know, to your own benefits uh, and, and make your project. I mean, like uh, a lot of ideas work in the dome compared to the ideas that don't work. 
So I yeah. would say that. Anybody else want to chime in on this on this quick topic? Yeah, I think I think still like the dome has a has its own uh, like culture. Like it, there is a lot of documentary or back like maybe twenty years ago, maybe maybe more. Uh, a lot of documentary science films and uh, so it's there is still there was there was like documentaries there was one also using like stop motion a really nice one i think uh, the orchid and the bee was a, a really nice one um using like um clay uh, it was really really great great piece so i think it's more um yeah it's more the, the range of, of topics is more wide i don't know why maybe it's because it's yeah like you said it's more niche so you have like many different people coming from many different backgrounds and and going to this medium like this it's maybe as a, even in immersive setups like like normal like museum you, you can you can feel there is like a an homogeneity homoge homogenization yeah, yeah something yeah. like this and and you can feel it like for uh, like live visual also but the yeah, dome is a, a bit particular on this and there is still like dome you use, we are discussing about many domes in many cities, but many domes in many cities are still doing science film, and they can't because they do also like school uh, topics, and and they have to to do like science films uh, production. So it's not like um, all not all the domes are, 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 have went crazy yet, but soon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so now, uh, Lydia, coming to you about your inspiration for for dome content. Um, and I'm going to hit you with a two a two question. Um, in terms of just pure aesthetic inspiration, I'm really interested kind of where that kind of comes from. But then also for the inspiration of how you want to use data, because I feel like the you know data art really has been a hot topic for at least a couple of years now. Maybe now it's kind of like now machine learning art is like the cool hot like data art kind of direction, but. You know, I think when you explained your piece as a kind of dream state and that combination of data plus dream state feels like a really unique one. So kind of what inspired you to go kind of in that direction as well? Yeah, um, in fact, I didn't want to do data art. I didn't want to go and have a database and try to illustrate the database. That's 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 something I, I, I may do in the future. But for this piece, I really just wanted to take the aesthetics of of all the graphs I, I drew and during all my classes and all the you know all the the different imagery economics imagery and I wanted to transform that into something that was very personal for me it was the aesthetic that um, that uh, I found that was the most representative of me so to find that aesthetic, actually, I do a lot of research online. I have a, a huge Pinterest that I just go through different artists. Um, Andy Gilmer was a, an artist that inspired me a lot. And, and I just take look different, whatever aesthetics really pleases me, I just put it in a, in a pin and I just collection, I have a full collection of different visual aspects that I love. And that becomes kind of my aesthetic. And then it goes subconsciously almost when I try to create my own words. And the result is what you saw is really, I didn't try to control something and to look at for it to look like something. I just wanted it to be an inspiration of every the work of art I, I looked at and I inspired from and to combine that with all the graphs, like I said, that I, I mm. drew and I that I studied for for years, and, and I still work with uh, in economics, and try to merge that into something very personal and uh, and unique for me. And I think a, a quick follow up question, which is interesting, because it ties back to kind of what we were talking about with the niche of the dome, because you also are doing like a lot of VJing and, and VJing content. Do you find the works that you're making for like live performance and VJing, are they more similar to the kind of works you're making for dome? Or does it feel like when, you know, you do dome work, you almost, you know, you, you turn your baseball cap backwards and it's like, now I'm free. Like I can do whatever I want now. Like, are, do you have that feeling or, or are they kind of just different sides of the same kind of expression for you? 
So actually, I, I, I use a lot of elements that I created for mm. VJing works, and I, um, which I created in Touch Designer, so I could re reprogram them to be uh, recorded as little clips for the dome. So I really took the elements that I worked already with for VJing. Oh, interesting. But then I then I went really nuts with it because I had fun because it, it's not like projecting the, on a 2D screen. I tried to imagine all those elements and what it would be if I walked through them. So that was the part that was fun with working with the dome is that I already had a lot of works um, that I could use, but I just rearranged them differently in a 3D world. And it, I, I thought it was, it gave me more freedom um, using all mm. those elements. And like I say, it, it becomes more of an experience because you are, you're walking, you're, you're looking through it and it, it surrounds you instead of just looking at, at a screen. So it gave me a lot of, um, it was a lot of fun actually to, to, to go from VJing my VJing elements to just creating a, a dome movie. Yeah, that sounds amazing. That sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> that definitely sounds like we're turning the the baseball cap backwards and, and diving in. Um, and Sebastian, so we're going to come to you next. Before we do, really quick, um, I saw Vincent is in the chat here from the SAT, and uh, he was mentioning the SAT has an artist residency program that welcomes creators to submit their full dome projects. We're currently catching up with delays created by the pandemic. But keep an eye on the activities of the SAT for the next calls. And we're going to put a link to the SAT in the chat as well, just because they're such a fantastic uh, organization we've worked with in the past. I remember my first Mutech was kind of like a really revolutionary experience for me and, and being around the SAT and, and all the cool things they're doing there. So we're going to put some nice links to our friends in the SAT in the chat shortly. Um, but Sebastian, so coming from your yep. background especially, because you also kind of had... You know, you were telling us earlier you had a graphic design career at the beginning. Then you yep. became, you know, the preacher of VR. So you already kind of made the transition once from 2D to kind of, you know, this this almost fully immersive. Did you find going from VR to immersive was another big kind of inspirational leap um, in terms of that change? And how do you find the inspirations were a little bit different between something like a, a graphic design background and, and working with dome content? Um, yeah, I think there were definitely like, after after doing that, like a lot of VR and uh, like was basically the connection with a, a real space and just with people, uh, mm -hmm. especially after the pandemic, like I was really, uh, it, it feels really good to be with people in the same in the same room and uh, i remember like when my my first like a uh, big piece uh, was in in beijing um, it was um uh, called bresh and uh, it was really huge like it was my first uh, like really like big immersive setup and, and when i stepped in doing like the, the testing and see if the renders were like the brightness was were fine contrast were fine and when i stepped step in, I say, okay, yeah, that's not VR, that you, you can feel the light, you can feel the space, you can mm -hmm. really, uh, and it's really, really something different in the connection with the space and, the, and with your body inside the space. That's definitely a step, uh, yeah, a different uh, like paradigm or, or, or something. And it's difficult for me to go back to VR now. It's a bit, a bit more difficult. Oh, oh interesting. And, no, don't um, worry. No. We're all, we're all in crazy places in different time zones, so it, and, <laughs> it's it's the natural way. And um, and and yeah, dome is uh, is also a great a great place to connect with with your your own body, like people, and 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 the sense of presence uh, uh, of the, the the actual like the screen and the the depth of of the work. So yeah, mm -hmm. I would say it's. Um, but I'm happy to. To do only immersive canvas now because it's uh, mm -hmm. i'm pretty sure it's starting to get like really new places like pop up like every week almost like uh, one in yeah. japan like eternal space or or like many many different immersive space and and dome might might pop up like new new specific for contemporary arts like dome yeah. space might, might pop up it really seems like it like we were talking to some nice friends out in thailand who are making a dome like right downtown <laughs> in in bangkok and i was like oh that's amazing like yeah it, who would have thought these domes would just be popping up everywhere? So, and, and going back to that inspiration idea, do you have, you know, when you're looking for inspiration to work with the dome, are you looking at specific kind of dome inspirations or is it kind of similar to what everyone's saying where, you know, just random things are drawing and the dome becomes this kind of like amazing experimental space? 
Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't check like specific dome content because it's uh, mm. like recent things, like maybe Dromos, like the first uh, set, um, Satosphere, like with um, Nautic and uh, mm. I forgot the name of the, the sound artist. But um, yeah, you, you can look at, at these, but the aesthetics might be, may be getting old a little now. Uh, and, and it's. Uh, yeah, I'm just looking at my own inspiration. I, I love glitch art. Uh, I also come for like one of my dreams is to connect like an old CRT TV and do like feedback loop old school and project into a dome or maybe like just filter through touch designer a little, but I would love to do like actual like with circuit bent like video processor and do it like to tap into the, the dome directly it would be amazing. Um, so yeah, I just I just use my, my personal like visual exploration and try, try to translate into into this space mm. um, but i don't i don't go back and look at the dinosaur full dome piece yeah you don't time. you're not you're not doing the 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 elementary school trip to the dome regularly <laughs> to watch uh you know the the land before time or flying maybe, through the galaxy it would be quite interesting actually to see yeah. uh, to take like a, a 20 years 20 years old piece a full dome like at the beginning and, and check like the narrative uh, tricks and, and, and it would be pretty cool actually. Mm. <laughs> so we're kind of at the halfway point of the session here um, and we've been having a lot of fun talking about all of the kind of artistic side of things. Um, we're going to transition a little bit now into talking about the technical side of things because I heard the word touch designer a lot that always makes me excited but we also heard Unreal from Sergey's side which makes me excited too. These are kind of two really amazing uh, kind of technologies that are kind of really like picking up steam and, and being used everywhere. Um, now, before we move on, um, you know, with all things, uh, let me tell you just a quick, you know, 10 seconds, the HQ Pro. We have a say, we have a promotion coming up next week. So if you're looking at the HQ Pro and you're like, hey, that seems like a cool spot to be, look at all the courses they have. They got 100 plus hours of courses. As May Sam was saying, we got, you know, every two weeks kind of group calls where we're working with our teachers and all of our members on, on what they're working on and trying to accelerate what they're doing. You know, if any of these things sound interesting to you, I'm going to put a link in the chat that's going to give you 50% off your first month. Let me see. Hold on. I got to find the chat. There's a lot of windows on my screen right now. There's that link in the chat. And I'm going to put a quick link here if you want to learn more about the interactive and immersive HQ. Um, Listen, and we're not going to do like a, we're not going to do a big we're not going to do a big thing here. This this is this is more nice relaxed. You can't end the artistic session and then go right into the pitch. That that's out of control. So I put the links in the chat. By all means, everyone enjoy those. Get into those. You're probably going to hear about it next week too when we have our promotion. But with that said, we're going to enter our technical block a little bit now, which is you can tell my my mouth is starting to water a little bit. Um, and I think the first place we got to start, because there's so many different avenues we can go down, is Sergey. I want to start with you, and we'll go through everyone in order. You know, from a really high level, what does your technical pipeline look like when it comes to working with a dome? Uh, yeah, uh, at the beginning, as an architect, we're using architectural software, uh, maybe mm -hmm. like, uh, as a Rhino, uh, Blender, to design really uh, and to, to study urban environment. And then we are lucky with uh, Unreal Engine, uh, and it's more and more new uh, plugins appearing as a data submit that allows easily bring huge environment, uh, even bigger city into a, a interactive world of Unreal yeah, Engine. Yeah, real time space, right? It's like crazy. Yeah, uh, in like in low resolution we can test it in real time and uh, to test uh, we can walk we can interact with our uh, uh, paths and at the same time we try to build a story uh, inside of this uh, virtual environment mm -hmm. and the, the our goal is to build really some virtual city that we are trying to work and uh, use it as a discipline to collaborate with uh, neuroscience or uh, with some mobile companies to test mm -hmm. uh, and to find a new tool or it's a positive human experience or it a new type of mobility to design new infrastructure. 
So are you basically like essentially like fully working like start to finish basically in Unreal for these kind of like and you know we can speak specifically about Labyrinth or even just your process in general but are you more or less fully in Unreal? Uh, no, I'm I'm doing all the programs basically from from the beginning from the idea from the design in uh, Rhino mm -hmm. and uh, okay, then cool. uh, or 3D Max and then import and it's many different phases. Mm. and to create or we can reuse some environment and mix in a real engine but in a real engine we what i said maybe it's a little bit similar experience with the labyrinth mm. when we from a uh, god point of view yeah from view from above from plant view jump into a human view and then it's mm. totally new type of design uh we designing as a pedestrian as a as a like really in human oh, as, a, as, a, as an experiencer almost your design yeah 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 and yeah. it's more kind of emotional design what we really mm -hmm. see how we move if we walk uh, with the five kilometers what we can see if we run the bike uh it's a 15 kilometers what how the mm -hmm. images change how the cities change what is the perspective that i think it's huge feel of research and it very um, like force us to study and i think um you know one of the big things that that's really recently happened is is the launch of unreal 5 like did you find that one um had features that you were really excited about or ha you know was labyrinth and unreal 4 or 5 like you know what what is kind of your big excitement that's coming up with with this new version of unreal for you it's yeah i didn't try it yet, Phil, because mm. like um, I'm had some setup already that I kind of, kind of reuse it many times. And when ray tracing and patch tracing was uh, coming, it already was a huge step because like uh, in patch tracing you can produce very nice images with the ray tracing, very nice movie. And mm. now Lumin coming in Unreal oh, Engine it's Five, so beautiful, right? Yeah, but I'm. I, so it's, it's coming soon, you, coming soon later. explorations. Coming soon. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> amazing, yeah. amazing. Um, and let's jump over to Maysem. Kind of from a high level, what's what's your technical pipeline look like? Oh, I know no. Touch Designer is in the Touch Designer is in there somewhere. <laughs> yeah, Touch Designer is in the core actually. Like, um, it it really depends. Sometimes I work with just like it, the footage and the input, like a fisheye input. And that's easy because you in touch designer, you only need to like set up a good and reasonable tops network. Uh, mm -hmm. So with that, you just processing image and adding F effects, you know, layer them over each other. That's one part, but, uh, and that's for when you don't have the enough time and deadline is close. You just want to grab something and, you know, you, you want to make something that is a, uh, so I use my my like pre-rendered library from C4D. Uh, I okay. mostly work there, you know, in terms of design, setting up the scenes. I like the lighting um, options in C4D very much, very profound. Um, so I, I, but I, at the same time, I try to uh, stay like very quite simple because I don't want to encounter this, uh, you know, like this uh, long rendering time waiting for hours for just uh, like a, you know like 10 second clip to be ready so i try to keep it simple um then i i either i for, for some for uh, if i want to make the project for some uh purposes i use c4d like lighting mm -hmm. and this and stuff for for a, a lot of purposes like point clouds particles you know all this kind of stuff glsl i use touch designer but after using all those um my workflow is what i really wanted to do uh, is to have some content on in c4d that it, it's reasonable and it's not too heavy and output it as vr so in a rectangular form and bring it into touch designer wrap it around the sphere so basically you have a 360 by 360 universe all around you mm -hmm. now what what i can do in that that sphere is uh to have freedom over camera movement so it's not that my camera is only in the middle of the dome looking upward no it's uh basically you have the camera you can look at any direction and then at that point i start like adding more depth uh to the scenes you know either geometries or you know like extra lighting and this kind of stuff uh, so also want to talk about hdri 
um, free content uh, on internet. You can you can totally find a lot of a lot of great great uh, images. Uh, you know, again, you don't need to go to C4D or uh, something else. Just bring those images, use them, wrap it around the sphere, and set up your lighting in Touch Designer, and then there you go. You have a uh, you have a full universe that you can you can do a lot of stuff with. And uh, in terms of sound, actually, um, yeah, because my my partner he's a sound engineer. We make this um, back and forth audio, and I. You know, at, at some point, I experiment with TD Ableton um, while in the making. So I, I, I get a sense, okay, I want to react to the kick or I want to react to the mm-hmm. snare or hi hat, you know, those kind of stuff. We make those kind of decisions along the way. And um, at some point, well, he, my, my partner, he goes on, he, he does the mixing and mastering and all the engineering. And then I have a full track. I bring it to Touch Design and I use the audio analysis uh, chain. Uh, which I really love. Uh, so that's uh, that's really, you know, like I think it really powerful uh, in terms of interactivity, you know, adding more sense of, uh, you know, like being alive to the, the to the whole world. Yeah, and that's a really interesting one. I think we're going to talk about this a little bit more after we kind of go through everybody, but this idea that even for a medium where we're producing kind of, you know, quote unquote films that are pre-rendered, con- just files that we're sending, you know, to a playback system, everyone has chosen real-time environments uh, to work in, which which almost seems a little bit like, oh, why, why would you do that? But, you know, and, and it feels like everyone has a different reason. You know, Sergey's coming from the background of having that new experience as, you know, the not the God view, but the person in the experience. And Mason, you're kind of saying similar that idea of render the environment, then play inside of the environment a little bit with like camera positions. Um, so Lydia, coming to you, I'd love to know a little bit kind of what your pipeline is like and even just starting to think about this idea of what kind of brings you towards a real-time environment versus, you know, just sitting inside of something like uh, C4D or Maya where hypothetical render quality could be maximum and the output is still going to be a file like what kind of brings you towards you know touch designer in these real-time environments well um i have to tell you i first started with quartz composer i don't know if anybody remembers Ooh, yeah. that <laughs> so i love the, the 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 kind of node based programming um it for me it feels like it almost like a video game it's i love the pro the problem solving with that and the creativity uh, outputs so um uh, but when Quartz Composer was uh, was was uh, well essentially left uh, left left by Apple, I had to find another programming environment that was similar, and I discovered Touch Designer. And mm-hmm. um, uh, you know, it's not it's 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 more of a part time thing for me. So the learning curve was pretty pretty hard, but I just love the Touch Designer the Touch Designer environment. So I didn't try any other environments. I played a little bit with Blender. So I didn't go through other environments. I just started learning touch designer. And more I learn, more I, I love playing with it and creating with it. Mm. So that's why I stayed with touch designer. And I love the fact that you can create, you know, you can create a, a composition and then you play around with it in real time. And even if you're going to create a, a, a perfect loop after, for for example, for my VGing, I create perfect loops that I can play in Resolume afterwards. But I can just change a few elements and then it just becomes something completely different. I just mm-hmm. love that element in real time. Uh, I, I plug it into my MIDI controller and I, it's just, it's, it's, it's like I say, it's almost like, it's like, like a game for me. So um, I created everything, all my, my, my uh, components in Touch Designer and for the dome, um, well, for the dome, I, in the render top, I rendered it in a cube map. And then mm-hmm. I rendered it in the projection for um, a fish eye because the sad dome is a 210 degree dome instead of a normal 180 degree dome. So touch designer with that top, you can uh, you can adjust the, the degrees of the dome. And uh, uh, that, uh, that added a lot of rendering time, by the way. Um, mm-hmm. But after that, uh, I had all those clips that I put together in After Effects. So After Effects was the the the, the I had to use it for my to mm-hmm. create the movie, but normally I just I just create clips with Touch Designer. That's really interesting. So from your kind of perspective of using Touch Designer, it's almost more of the the freedom to play aspect as well, like being Absolutely. able to make something, control it live, 
you know, you mentioning the MIDI controller, maybe this is connected a little bit to, you know, your, your love of, of VJing and, and kind of performing, being able to bring that into this kind of like more movie based, film based kind of medium of it. Yeah. Um, now we also have a question. Problem. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. It's, it's just, it's so, so much problem solving also, and it's mathematical. Mm. It's just so much fun. Do you wish that Excel looked like Touchdown? Do you wish you could bring, you know, mix a little bit of the economics data, do it in Touch Designer, output an Excel file? Oh, I've done a lot of beautiful Excel creations, but Ooh, oh. not very visual. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Uh, and we have a question in the chat specifically for you, which is, did you start with Touch Designer on Mac or Windows? And are you still using a Mac as your main tool? Yes, unfortunately, uh, I'm mm. on a Mac. And um, there are certain parts of Touch Designer that don't work with Mac. And I've, mm -hmm. been, I've been considering more and more trying to go on a PC uh, if I mm -hmm. want to go, uh, because I've, I, I worked so much with it, I, I'm thinking of getting a PC. But that's amazing. So, so all the stuff you've been doing is even with, because you know, a lot of times we talk about like the Mac version of Touch Designer versus the Windows version. And, the Mac version keeps getting more and more features added to it, but there's always like a few things that are like, oh yeah, you know what, this one doesn't work on Mac, this one doesn't work on Mac. So you actually made all of this kind of uh, lovely piece like on the Mac version. Yeah, I, I found a lot Amazing. of workarounds. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, there must, there must have been a lot of, the, the play time must have stopped a little bit and uh, coming together to kind of put it together. That's really amazing. Congratulations. And I think that's just a great, you know, that's, it shows that the Mac version of Touch Designer is powerful enough that you can do like a lot of, of really great things. And I, especially uh, Greg's mentioning in the chat, the new Vulcan version in the experimental is going to even unlock some more of that. So that's an, so you might not have to buy a PC soon enough, you know, maybe if you hang in there, <laughs> hang in there a little bit long enough, it, you get all the features soon. Uh, so that's amazing. So then coming over to Sebastian, what is yeah. kind of your technical pipeline look like from like a high level? Cause I, I think you had mentioned touch designer in there a little bit too. Yes. Of oh. course. Of course, of course. <laughs> so, so actually, I used for a piece long time ago. I I haven't used. I've used Unity because I oh, had a lot of, I've worked a lot with Unity for VR and um, Unreal also back then. But uh, I was more familiar with Unity, so I use and you can take. I could take. I, I remember using. Uh, I think it, it was one of the of uh, KG um mm. point cloud uh, render back then, and. And I could now with the VFX graph, you can bring like a lot of point cloud. But back then, it's like in Touch Designer, I, I, I had like I don't know how many millions points, so I couldn't like Touch Designer couldn't take it. And mm. um, and also using the um, Cine Machine and all the the, the timeline uh, tool, um, it's really really uh, really great tool in Unity to to control the, the sequencing and the, the camera movement. Also, is is pretty clean. Uh, mm -hmm. But for my last piece, yeah, Touch Designer mainly, uh, also because Touch Designer got like a huge upgrade with um, uh, the point cloud um, module and, and and the point file in, and, and or you, you have a lot of more of control. It's more seamless, like you don't have to go through uh, complicated. You can work with textures directly. And it's it's been amazing, and um, but yeah, all real time softwares. I also use uh, After Effects for final processing. I could do the, right. the pixel sorting in, in Touch Designer. I've done it before for real-time short pieces, but it, it takes a lot of, uh, when you go 4K and pixel sorting, it's uh, real-time, it, it gets it gets ugly <laughs> at some point. Yeah. You need a lot of processing. You can go like GLSL, but I, I don't have the knowledge of, of GLSL uh, so And much. even then, it still becomes a pretty intensive yeah, it's quite intense. which you don't which you don't have a lot of control over <laughs> you, you just yeah, you, hands off the keyboard now you know that it, that's how a little bit of pixel sort feels like um, yeah. but I was gonna ask you so coming from that transition of, of unity kind of being the main thing you were using before and then coming to this piece that you also mentioned was kind of a it was like a 3d scanner point cloud of a flower that yeah. you brought in so and you were saying the point file in kind of really helped accelerate like that whole GPU accelerated pipeline of point clouds. Were there other things that you found interesting? And you know, you could say you know Unity was maybe better at this, Touch was better at this. Like, but was there some interesting things that you discovered moving kind of from that Unity over to Touch Designer? Mm. So it's a bit different how you manipulate the, the point cloud in Unity. You can also work with a like texture map, but uh, 
yeah mm -hmm. touch designer is more powerful to work like if you want to go full textures for to control like even like morphing or it's it's way more uh, powerful and, and touch designer can take like any formats you can take a lot more than than unity unity you need plugins you need your your scene setup it needs to be really clean your project like mm -hmm. depending on, on what you want to do um it might be a bit it, it's less open than, than touch yeah touch you can mm -hmm. can really feel in like any 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 data any format and it will it will take it at some point and it's also more flexible on the, the output so usually for previous pieces i use um can use even like a uh, equi rectangular um, output or, or like multiple screens with like four camera rig and in the same object and you and you animate all the whole rig that works well um but yeah i guess it's yeah touch designer it's difficult to to beat uh i how to say it like the interoperability yeah 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 that's uh not sure i never try like v uh what is called vvv or oh v4 yeah vvv v4 vvv yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so but yeah node based uh really uh really open it's yeah, yeah. the designer is quite unique um and unreal i'm starting to i i will have to learn again unreal 5 <laughs> i mean just to catch up for a project so mm -hmm. I can wait it looks I, I really like to to see what uh, also like the nanite uh, oh yeah the render. the way it does the like micro tessellation yeah I'm not sure to, it basically makes things look <laughs> super dense yeah you can you can you can drop like a, a 20 million mesh into your scene and and, and maybe use it looks yeah. pretty cool <laughs> yeah now this is a question I'm going to ask you and then uh, I'm also going to ask Sergey next which is because um, one of the things I find that's that's interesting about these different environments is kind of their strengths and their weaknesses. And for example, one thing that really is difficult for a lot of uh, new artists and developers that come to Touch Designer is this concept of like the timeline. You know, how do I, you know, I want to make a piece and I know all of the steps of the ballet and I want them all to happen at this specific time. And I feel like environments like Unreal and Unity have a little bit better infrastructure for that kind of, of, of yeah. workflow. Did you find that was a challenge for you coming to Touch Designer? Or was it, you know, was it on the other side, like maybe, oh, no, because we were talking with Lydia earlier about this performance idea of it. Like, or did it become more freeing that now you weren't kind of locked into this timeline and now you're performing a little bit more? Because I could see it going both ways for just depending on how your mindset works. Like, what was your experience coming from? an environment with kind of a bit more timeline infrastructure to touch designer, which has a, a kind of a little bit less of that. Um, I'll, I, I know it's possible to do, I haven't done it, like like doing actual like sequencing and, and, mm -hmm. and controlling the full narrative uh, in touch. It mm -hmm. just needs some extra nodes. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I was also embracing the, just the, the live uh, aspect of it for this piece. Mm -hmm. And uh, but I definitely it would, maybe it exists like um, but uh, it would be great to have like an like a full uh, sequencing like event trigger but maybe a more like structured in touch would be it would be amazing. I really mm -hmm. love the um, the Unity one. Um, I don't remember if Unreal might be like blueprint blueprint based or with an actual like timeline. And and I think yeah, Lydia done like the sequencing in. Uh, more like in a traditional way in uh, After Effects, like like a movie mm -hmm. sequencing with different shots. It's also a, a pretty flexible way you can you can work on your on your specific shots and then recompose like a traditional movie. It's, it works well. But um, it would be great to have a, yeah something more easy in touch to to control uh, mm -hmm. from the the startup. Yeah, it might be already here, but I, I'm not aware of it. Yeah, I think right now it's a little bit of a timer chop. Uh, okay. You know N NASCAR of timer chops. <laughs> let's get let's get a lot of timer chops. Let's get them all running real fast, and and we'll work from there. And so Sergey, a similar question for you, but a little bit of a different angle is when you're working inside of Unreal on these pieces and that kind of viewer experience. Do you find it's more of a performative kind of exploration, or is it more of you know you have a timeline or sequencer open, and you know you're you're kind of finding elements and like oh must got to sequence that like are you a really heavy sequencer slash timeline kind of, of person who's thinking about these kind of pieces um 
I think it's I think it's both. Uh, but uh, what we were like in Unreal Engine in real time, we can test really um, the the emotion like this, the immersive really experience with acceleration, mm -hmm. deceleration. We are, in Unreal uh, Engine, we try to work as a replica in physical world. Yeah, uh, as a mm -hmm. replica of our kind of uh, also feeling the, the space. And then with the camera movement, with the, this all uh, mm, camera pipelines, we can easily uh, test uh, when we really have immersive feeling, when camera accelerating, what kind of feeling we coming from from like center of, from us or when it but that's we can test just in basically in immersive environment as a dome because mm. in the screen it doesn't work and um, yeah we replicating the physical physical uh, our needs in in gaming software so it's almost like uh, even though it's there it's it's almost a secondary thing for you inside of Unreal you you're, you're kind of going in there exploring the environments Exactly. Finding feeling, the things that make the emotions. Yeah. And then, the, you know, just, you know, okay, yeah, throw it in the sequencer later, throw it in the sequencer later. Exactly, exactly. And I, I think that's, um, we are thinking about uh, environment as a three-dimensional, like a, a dynamic structure. Hmm. And we uh, want to explore this space or uh, um, shape of the city or of the architectural piece as a dynamic object. And then it possible in Unreal Engine, I don't know any other all the unity of course but uh, that you can't do in 3d max or in other yeah absolutely program. now kind of moving into our, like our, our next topic uh one of the really interesting things i wanted to ask everybody was if they had any kind of recent like technical breakthrough that they remember that you know oh i figured out how to do this or um this new feature came out and it really kind of opened everything up for me so, Sergey, from your kind of experience, like, have you had a recent kind of technical breakthrough that's really changed kind of your work? And it, um, for you, it's a little bit of a side question. Do you want to show us your dome? Because <laughs> it's really cool. Yes, yes, sure, sure. Because uh, that, that yeah. could, that, I think for a lot of people, that would be the technical breakthrough is, you know, we got a dome. <laughs> that's that's kind of amazing. Yeah, basically, it's our, like, uh, working um, yeah, a dome. setup. <laughs> yeah, full dome Fridays. We're real now, and now it's real. <laughs> now That's it's awesome. uh, unfold. Yeah, because it's with a uh, negative pressure that the screen is uh, uh, waiting when it would be yeah. running. But uh, yeah, I think uh, like all these elements uh, are open new world for design that we are try to to uh, develop further. Interactive design, human basic design, or like a in a positive emotion design, and uh, I think the, the the new technology give for architects very great tool to 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 perceive the space. And um, I I don't know if I I said before like this Unreal Engine it was totally new universe mm. that we opened three four years ago. And what's the, because I remember there's a really big uh, architectural, is it twin motion? There's a really big architectural rendering kind yeah, of. twin motion like, came a bit later. Yeah, yeah, but I, I think it, um, it's uh, good for architectural. Yeah, it's might maybe easier to use. And we mm -hmm. try to a little bit get more into also gaming. Yeah, that's, uh, mm -hmm. we want to bring people to play or like ride a bike or uh, interact with our uh, in urban environment. And mm -hmm. um, in Unreal Engine, we have a little bit with the blueprints, more possibilities to program it. Mm -hmm. uh, Twin motion, I'm, no, I didn't use it, but what I mm -hmm. know, it's a little bit more kind of for, for video presentation or something like that. Yeah. It, and it, do you find it's more, it's more customized. That yeah. Is, and do you find that kind of from your this. experience working in Unreal, those blueprints are really like fundamental to, to you being able to, like you were saying, program these different things? Because I feel like there's there's one side of Unreal users which are 
you know, coming from a really more traditional game development. So they're already kind of software developers. They're yeah, like, yeah. let us add the code. Let let me, you know, kind of and very similar. Sebastian probably can mention like the from the Unity side. They're like, let me add the C sharp. Let me just start programming objects. But Blueprints, I feel like it kind of opens it up a little bit to to more artists kind of getting in there and programming logic. Like, do you find blueprints are something that you're really using a lot of inside of these kind of um, pieces no, or, I think or kind it's, of dome environments? It's for us. It's maybe it's final step when we have mm. set up our environment and we we are not uh, experienced or like we we not uh, programmers. But mm. in a um, user level, we can adjust some like a simple game or not uh, advanced, but really just to walk through or just uh, adjust a little bit kind of maybe blueprint that even we can buy in market uh, mm. or a little bit follow some tutorials. But it's the last step of our production. Yeah, First, it's like a design oh, and then... Yeah. Kind of uh, design inside of Unreal Engine, we arrange uh, uh, environment, and on the end, we can add some interaction on top of it, but not advanced. And that's interesting. So, so it really because you know the the more we're kind of talking about your work, it really is that sense of let's go in the space, explore ourselves manually. And then really, like you're saying, that last step is, oh, let me, you know, I'll make a few simple blueprints to maybe expose this value just so I can change it easily. Or, you know, you'll grab something off the, the Unreal store and put it in here just to give you a little bit of extra, you know, this or that. But because I feel like a lot of interactive artists and like immersive artists, they're coming from that idea of let me make a system that kind of like plays itself a little bit. But for you, it's yeah. still very much your exploration. And then, you know, just a little bit of, of icing sugar of blueprints on the end exactly yeah it's more more mm. in kind of infotainment that we are trying to use uh, the blueprint mm. you know when we mm, we can produce the movie or we can pre-render it to dome format uh, at the same time we can send a link to people who want to really uh get experience mm. or like a little bit yeah um, Touch That's with amazing. our urban service yeah. design. Uh, and we're going to come back. I'm going to come back to the dome because the dome, the dome fascinates me. Well, we're going to come back to that. So I wanted to jump to Mason. Kind of the same question. Like what kind of really recent technical breakthrough do you find has changed your workflow, changed your pipeline, increased your ability to kind of create really interesting and dynamic things? Like does anything really stick out for you? Pretty much uh, what I was explaining before, you know, like before I um, I used to use plugins to uh, that kind of simulate the dome environments, and what that plugins do, it's kind of limiting because it's it gives you like a semi 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 sphere universe all around that you can place your stuff in. But realizing, you know, thinking about the workflow, kind of kind of making connections between these immersive projections. Uh, that uh, in touch design at a projection top, you go in a rectangular cube map, you know, fisheye, all those kind of things. But uh, for me, it was a breakthrough. Um, it happened before when I realized that, okay, uh, why not grabbing one of those, you know, like the projections, like we like the equi rectangular or, or VR, like or cube map that captures the entire board and let's bring it into touch designer and you know, just capture a semi-sphere out of it. Uh, mm -hmm. That that opened, opened the door uh, for a lot of creativity for me. So I wasn't worrying about, you know, like the camera not being in a light, right place. Uh, because usually for those prop plugins is that the situation is that the camera is in the center and is locked and is looking upward. So it's always in the center of the dome. But here with this workflow, you have the freedom, you can interact with, you know, your environment, whatever you make. And it really, if you start from, if I start from that point, uh, it always, you know, like it's going to end up in a very better place. So um, kind of kind of what the, the, our, our fellow artists said, you know, kind of reducing the time that you put on production and, you know, just design, mm. 
and adding more uh, time to your processing time. And you know, that, that, that's very important for me. Um, you know, right now I realize that how effective this uh, workflow is. Uh, even if you're working with like 360 cameras and everything, bringing their output to a project, there's still, uh, it's a lot. So um, I, I think that's that workflow that you can connect the, this immersive projections together and at the end grab a, uh, uh, fisheye or a, or a semi sphere out of it. It's it's very cool, and it really added to to, to my workflow. And those plugins you're talking about, those are kind of from the Cinema 4D side. Is that right? Like the being able to go from Cinema 4D, put in some dome plugins. Those are the ones that you're talking about that had like that limiting factor to them. Yeah, that's it. That that's true. But uh, yeah, you can. There are also workflows, you know, for for Blender. It has a, not not a plugin, but it has a certain uh, you know like like tricks that you, you get a yeah before you know I am not working mm -hmm. with Blender right now. It was before it was a little bit of challenge, you know, just to get the right content for the uh, for the dome. Um, but right now, pretty much um, all the engines that are available, they're offering the the equi rectangular or the VR output, and that's enough mm -hmm. that. That kind of removes the need for any plugins or you know any intermediate software that you use, and uh, yeah, for me that that was a that was a point that I realized. Wow, it can be so powerful, you know, bringing that into touch, um, wrap it around the sphere, have your camera looking at all directions, whenever you want to go, you want to get close to the objects, or you know, that 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 was uh, kind of the breakthrough for me. So that's interesting. So it's almost like the. I think what almost a lot of people would consider such a small feature, you know, the ability to just, yes. oh, let me let me export my VR output or my Equi rectangular output for my software. Yes. For you kind of opened up these doors of being able to move between these different kind of software pipelines yeah. that you had in a really fluid way, in a really exactly. kind of expressive way, and almost like a non, you know, like non-destructive editing kind of way where you could take... Exactly that environment from C4D, bring it to the touch designer, play with it, you know, move the camera still and do all kinds of stuff. And the be beauty of it is that, you know, like talking about that processing time, you can do tons mm. of work in touch designer in real time. So like, even if your scene is very simple, sometimes it's just a very like a 10 second animation, um, you know, or, or like just a still image coming from C4D. But you can you can add a lot of lighting and you know like lighting is such a such a important mm. element yeah, in our in our industry. You can totally tell a tell a story with lighting and, and you know like uh, so you have the privilege to 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 use all those lighting you know like uh, environment light in touch designer. Um, it, it totally adds a lot and you know like just playing with your uh, um, your. Uh, as, as a texture in PBR, you're playing with those parameters mm. of PBR, you know, like your imagine your your image or your animation is wrapped around the sphere inside the touch designer, and you put an environment light in your scene, you put up, you know, different cameras or, or uh, you, you play with those texture parameters. It's, it's, it's really exciting for me, you know, like all the time. I, I think that it's not been explored enough. Um, mm -hmm. There is still a lot of rooms, you know, people can do, you know, like crazy stuff uh, with this only processing things. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, it's so interesting just hearing everyone's different kind of perspectives on what, what's been exciting for them. And, and Lydia, coming to you, like what has been a big technical breakthrough that, that you felt in, in kind of your content? And, and you can probably even answer both from the sides of that kind of VJ experience and that kind of full dome experience because there's probably something that's crosses between them but there's probably a little bit of separation between some interesting stuff for you as well well i consider myself still a, a touch designer beginner you know i i i really started working with it a year and a half ago so mm -hmm. the technical breakthroughs for me are just learning and learning and learning more about about uh, all the tops and chops but um something that helped me for the full dome um to 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 create this full dome movie was that the touch designer community is is really a great community that 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 just um uh, uh, that uh, shares the uh, mm. different uh, tops and uh, different components uh, uh, on the on the forum and there's this um full dome preview uh, top that was that's uh, from is that from fred 
Yes, exactly. That 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 I use so much. I couldn't have done the movie without this full down preview uh, tool, and it just helped me um, because it was also my first full down movie. <laughs> so mm. it really helped me to know how to put the the components uh, to uh, how to do the composition. So this tool was really a, a lifesaver, and there's so many helpful tools out there. So that I would say that's really what helps me. Uh, in my touch designer learning journey and, uh, mm. and VGing. And um, for the VG part, um, what was really helpful was, I think it was maybe you did that video of how to do a perfect loop. <laughs> so really oh, simple yeah. stuff. <laughs> you know, when you're a beginner, you're like, how can I do this? There's no timeline. There's, you know, and there's all those those resor resources that help you. And then you you have those tools. And it, I, I, I put them in my toolbox and I know they exist. Mm. And it really just helps me uh, move forward with my, with my work. So I guess picking up on that, which is an interesting kind of idea, since you're kind of experiencing a lot of these breakthroughs like regularly, is there something that you're kind of excited about breaking through still? Like, is there, you know, like you're like, oh, if I'm hungry to learn a little bit more about the uh, tops because I know it's going to let me break through this avenue or I'm really excited to learn about, you know, materials because it'll break me through this avenue. Like, is there something that you're kind of like really excited to break through still? Yeah, I have started to learn GLSL, um, Ooh, which yeah. is really hard <laughs> for a beginner, but uh, it's really helping me understand the 3D environments because that's that's been something new for me also because as doing visuals, you know, I create 3D, 3D models, but I didn't really exploit that. But to really fully understand that environment, I think that GLSL is really helping me with that. Mm. But I'm, and I have to tell you, every time I learn something new, it's like you said, it's a breakthrough and it's just, it's, it's so much fun. So it's everything it's still a journey so mm -hmm. yeah. and I'm always curious because you know GLSL is one of those interesting topics because everyone has a different reason why they're learning it you know was there something you saw that somebody did with GLSL and you're like I want to go that looks cool or was it you know to your point one of the really fun things about learning GLSL is kind of even if you never use it it really changes how you see things like tops and texture processing and it kind of really takes you under the hood of like, oh, this is how the GPU is thinking. This is totally different than how I was thinking. Uh, was there something that really like piqued your interest in diving into GLSL? Yeah, exactly. Um, yes, uh, because I, I, how I learn is with tutorials. So mm. I see different tutorials and I try to, to take a look at kind of visual and uh, visuals that, that interest me. And the most interesting ones were always made with GLSL. So mm. I'm like, okay, I'm going to have to start learning GLSL. And, um, but it's how you said, it really makes you understand how everything works. Like just the, the, the tops, how to do the circle top. Now I understand how, how the circle is, is made. I didn't even think about that, but it really mm. helps you understand how, uh, under the hood, like you're seeing for all the, the different elements of a touch designer. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. And, and I, you know, I'm, I'm probably on the, uh, the camp of GLSL users that does the not fun stuff. So I like doing <laughs> efficient compositing and, uh, you know, making video switchers in GLSL, not so much the creative stuff. So it's always interesting to hear kind of what gets people excited about it. Uh, and Sebastian, coming back to you, you know, we talked about this point clouds being like a really interesting kind of exploding world of, you know, what you can do inside a touch designer. But are there other kind of really big technical breakthroughs that kind of recently reminded you like, oh man, this is like a whole new world I could go into? Mm. Yeah, recently, I'm, I'm still waiting of maybe like light fields in the future. Mm. Like I want to do glitch art with light fields at some point. And do like, oh, and that would be crazy. Yeah, that would be great. Now it's still like the, the huge and, and yeah, like being able to capture like full dome content and readjusting the, um, the focus on, on areas, maybe one day, now it's still like gigabytes and gigabytes. It's still mm. the, the limit, I guess. I remember like uh, in VR, they had like some demos of light field. It, it's quite amazing, but it's still the oh, beginning. Really? It's like, yeah, I think oh, Google wow. had uh, some like, Google light fields and it's it's pretty impressive. Uh, if you combine it with uh, what is called like uh, eye tracking, you can you can get like real life focus inside the, the headset, but it's still yeah. So that's that would be uh, the next thing. And and point cloud is getting 
I don't have an iPhone or iPad, but I'm I was the new ones with the was, lidar, right? Yeah, I was getting excited, like super excited about this, and and then I'm not sure if it's usable. I think it's fine. Like so I, I'm not sure about yeah. if you can get a, a really clean output from it. Have you have you tried it again uh, lately? I haven't tried it, but Crystal Zhao, who's an artist who worked with us at the HQ a lot and does like a lot of like really amazing content for our YouTube and blog. Uh, she had been using it. I think she did a blog post, kind of how to three D scan something really easily, bring it into Touch Designer, and uh, you know play with it as an FBX. And it seemed like such an easy process now, which was really amazing for me because I remember, you know, you tried to do this like eight years ago. It was the photogrammetry yeah. version, and you're kind of awkwardly walking around taking a hundred pictures, and it, you know it kind of worked, but like nah, it had not really worked. Um, yeah. So it seems like such an amazing thing. And and actually, the, going with that. I was playing with this guy, this this Z2i camera, and I didn't realize, but it has a full like 3D scanning mode, and you just you start going like this, and and it's just saving point clouds and texture data. Um, okay. So it really feels like that. So is that something that's ex exciting for you? This ability to take the real world, because that's kind of the in in even going back to the piece is you know you brought the flower into this digital world and started manipulating it. Is that something that's really exciting for you that you kind of want to break yeah, through and uh, find out ways of bringing real life into the digital world? Yeah, I'm, I'm really interested in, in organic texture also. Mm. Uh, and that's that's one. I really like the idea of like just, um, just, oh, prélevé, Lydia in English, like to prélevé. Uh, prélevé, elevate? Uh, no, no, it's like when you, when you capture and you, or like a sample, you just take a that's sample thing, out. Yeah. Gathering media, yeah. So, um, um, like, especially the colors, like, uh, I haven't touched, like, in my piece, it's like the original colors. I haven't, maybe just slight saturation boost, but that's it. Um, and I find it really interesting to, to being able to, to capture shapes and, and colors and, and and combine them. I have another project where I, I'm building, like, also, like, small totems. Uh, oh, cool! Based on 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 real, uh, real places and colors, and you can combine them into like those digital sculpture paintings, and it's um, yeah, it's it's a way of also like doing painting, compositing, and uh, like an old school painter would would do. But it's it's even it's easier to just capture. But I still work uh, and do do the photogrammetry like weird. In the streets, like people look at me often, or at like a red traffic light, and I'm just like mm -hmm. catching. It's easy to do it with videos now, also. And I use reality capture. I haven't mentioned this one, but uh, reality capture. So that's the Autodesk cool. one, right? Is that that's the Autodesk reality capture? Uh, no, I think I think Epic Games bought it recently. Oh, oh, who? There you go. Yeah. Epic Games. Yeah, but now. Um, yeah. No, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, and see, that was a, so it's not a paid software. You pay what you, the more you process, uh, the more you pay. You pay like PPI, yeah. pay per input. Oh, so. interesting. Yeah. And is, is it a lot of like cloud processing that that's kind of like what you're paying for mm. a little bit is setting all this stuff up, getting the cloud process and come down? Oh, no, because it's, it's quite fast, but you pay for the more, the more picture you have or the more inputs you have. You have ah, I see. So yeah, huge project, you're going to pay more, I guess. But uh, yeah, the new technology, um, maybe like what, what could be the next step of um, of point clouds and, and photogrammetry and point cloud manipulation? What could be maybe I'm I'm, I'm wishing of like just uh, the quantity of point cloud being able mm. I can I could be able to process. Uh, now it's fine with GPU particles, like even in Unity with a VFX graph, uh, you can do a, a lot of you can control a lot of points, and but I'm pretty sure it's going to get bigger and bigger. <laughs> Even so next crazy, idea yeah. Is, yeah, more more processing power. It's always good. Yeah, that's a lot of fun, and I think that ability, you know, and we got some folks in the chat mentioning, yeah, reality scan, and you know, the commercial cost of three D scanning and printing coming down is like a really cool kind of breakthrough opportunity in our industry. Um, now, I, I'm you remember I was telling you guys at the beginning of the session, like the two hours going to fly by <laughs> pretty quick. Uh, so we're kind of at the last question. And what I wanted to do is go around to everybody um, and two questions for everybody. One is if you had one tip that you could give yourself in the past, you know, what would it be? Can be related to anything. If it's dome related, awesome. If it's art related, process related, 
uh, anything, you know, what tip would you give yourself in the past? And then what are you going to be working on for your next project? And while you guys are kind of going through and, and we're talking through that, I'm going to put everybody's social links into the chat. So everybody in the chat, thanks for being with us today. Uh, we had a really lovely time talking to our amazing artist. Make sure you follow all of these amazing artists and see more of their work coming out. So Sergey, I want to start with you. What tip would you give yourself in the past and kind of what's your next project? Uh, about tips, I, I, I would say uh, focus more on the script. Uh, invest mm. more time on the script at the beginning and follow close as possible of this. And because in Labyrinth, I get lost a little bit what, what I want to achieve on the end or where I want to. And uh, I think would be more uh, helpful to write the script, invest time on storyboard and what you really want to say. Uh, next project, it's like a little bit here, a little bit there. I don't know what would be first. Uh, and one project, very exciting. It's ongoing project with a collaboration uh, with uh, neuroscience and architects. And uh, I'm still experimenting with the architectural movie, try to bring like a temporal dimension in uh, architectural storyline. And I hope to, to make some new movie to the next festival. That's amazing. And we put Sergey's Instagram in the chat. Make sure you follow Sergey. Amazing work. Congratulations on the excellence award that you won for Labyrinth. A really amazing piece. Um, a lot of fun to watch. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. No problem. And Maysan, my friend, uh, what is your tip that you would give to past you? And what is your next project coming up that you're thinking about? Um, oh, for sure. The, the tip is, um, you know, just um, and as Sergey said, invest time on, at the beginning. So you, you have a roadmap of where you want to start and where you want to go. And uh, just trying it to to worry less about the prediction side of thing and more, you know, put more time into processing because, uh, yeah, that that really can that can be you know like it can totally change the how your work looks. Um, you know, I've had I have I've had experience. Uh, you know, like I work on a project, it looks fantastic on my screens, on my computer, and you know, like I. I tested with Dome Simulator. I even make my own Dome Simulator in Touch Designer. I tested it. It looks fantastic, but uh, you know, like it, it goes to the dome, um, and e each dome basically it depends. But a lot of domes, they their projection systems are different. Some of them are they have a central like a fisheye projector. Some of them are you know they come with multiple projects uh, projectors that they can you know kind of overlap and kind of feel fill a whole um, screen uh, so it's important to to know about you know those those kind of things and uh, to always have like as like a safety measure for yourself in terms of you know how sharp your colors look and everything um the compositioning at the end uh, you know like uh, this this is one tip i give to myself and about the future project um with one of the friends we are working and and with our team we are working on a um, on a project, I don't know where it's gonna, you know, like actually execute the project, but it's a uh, it's a combination of the full dome immersive um, universe, which is in the background, and in front of it, there are uh, like uh, two dancers uh, that oh, they perform awesome. a certain scenario, and uh, um, it's it's all the motion tracking of those uh, dancers, and at the same time, they are uh, imagining that they're the using props or kind of the objects to 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 make the performance fit and and uh, just being able to project projection map on on, on those uh, you know props for example like if it's like a certain block they're putting the block on top of each other you're doing the projection mapping at the same time you're reacting to their motion at the same time and you have this um, immersive universe at the back it's a combination of this uh, we're still working on it, and uh, but it's um, yeah. I, I I hope it's gonna be our next project. Uh, we'll see what's gonna happen. <laughs> that sounds amazing. So if you want to learn more about that, you definitely have to follow Maysem's socials <laughs> that I just put in the chat. And you know, I want to take this quick moment just to give you a special thank you, my friend, because oh. you know these. So let me tell you a little bit, just a, a quick side story. So uh, I'm sitting at home. 
and I get an email from May Sam and he says, you know, oh my God, my piece got accepted into SatFest. And we're like, oh, oh, and we we're like having a party. We're like, oh, amazing, amazing, amazing. And then I, what was it, a couple months later, you emailed me and said, oh, I met a bunch of really amazing artists at SatFest. Like, I think it would be really cool if we did a live stream or something like w with them. And I was like, oh, that's amazing. <laughs> like, yeah, sure. Like, so far, I haven't even done anything, by the way. I'm just <laughs> saying, yes, awesome on email chains. Um, and then Mason did this really amazing thing where he connected, reached out to all of you, kind of put all of us in touch, uh, brought all of us together to kind of do this really fun event. Um, and that's something that I think goes underappreciated a lot of time because I think from the outside, we think that these events kind of magically <laughs> just happen. But usually it takes somebody's kind of courage, initiative, and, you know, just drive to and love for domes to, to kind of bring everybody together. So uh, thank you, May Sam, for that. That's awesome. And everybody in the chat, a little round of applause for May Sam for, for helping us put this together. A lot of fun, a lot of fun. Um, and make sure you follow May Sam's socials, obviously. Thanks. That's the, so I'm going to say it again and again. So thank you, my friend. Now, uh, Lydia, what is your tip for your past self and what is coming up next for you? Yeah, so my tip, um, it's for the dome format. It's mm. to realize how much space you have on the dome to fill with elements. Because normally when you create visuals, you're on your computer screen. I have a pretty big computer screen, but still it's not as big as a dome. So you sometimes create things that you think that are proportionally going to look nice. But then it's going to look huge on the dome and you could have a lot more elements that you can put. So when I started working on my movie, I was doing bigger elements. But then as I realized that, hey, I have a lot of screen on the dome. And so I started reducing the size of all of my elements. And I, I, I'm really glad I did that because or else mm -hmm. it would have looked way too big. So I think it's just to realize that to to know that the size of the screen you're going to work with and adjust the the, the size of your elements your components uh, um, accordingly even if it really looks small on your screen so that would be my my tip for me and uh, in the future well i've been approached by a, a, a art collective that's called carols and they've been working uh, for two years a uh, really cool project um, uh, for two years of a sort of uh, interactive tools to uh, that are gonna that can um, that can move music and uh, lighting and images with a cerebral activity. So uh, Ooh, I would cool. be yeah. So um, I think it was it's with OSC uh, controls. Mm -hmm. and so uh, I would be helping them uh, illustrate that. So that's a really cool project. I look forward to. Amazing. And if you want to see more on that project, make sure you follow Lydia's Instagram, which I just posted in the chat. And also, congrats again on the Campus Sat Special Award that you got for the festival. Amazing work, as always. Um, and our final panelist here, Sebastian, what is um, your tip for the past, past Sebastian? And then um, what is coming up next for you, my friend? So the tip, I would say... Like um, like the famous video, just just do it, <laughs> just just just. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You really need to do it, and I remember. Careful, first... Nike Nike is gonna copy strike us. We're gonna get a copyright <laughs> strike from Nike after this. <laughs> Maybe a YouTube like no, the no, algorithm no, no, no. is always always watching. Yeah, they're, they're watching. But uh, yeah, just just step into it. It's like I remember like the first time stepping in touch designer, I was a bit overwhelmed. But then like YouTube tutorials, and like a few years later, it's like. You're leveling up. You're gonna get used to it, and and yeah, JLSL takes more time, but it's just should be fine. And um, I remember like my first uh, uh, piece for Satfest. I was like in one day. I, I checked. I didn't know about the, the full dome format, so I checked everything mm -hmm. I could find. And because the deadline was in five days, so I had to adapt my piece in three days and do with the rendering time. And, uh, and uh, I remember, and I've done it, and I've been selected, and it was great. But it took me one week, and uh, and I, I I learned a lot in just a few days. And and it's just when you when you when you understand the yes yeah, the pipeline and the actual space where what it means, um, and if you have a little knowledge of of yeah real time real time engine, uh, you, you will find bridges and and knowledge bridges between many many software. You still need like a basic knowledge of 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 what like a 3D, uh, our, our 3D world or need to be built, but uh, all mm -hmm. the camera things, it's it's just like, it will be fine. <laughs> so yeah. just just do it and step in, into the, the new format. It's, it's 
not impossible at all. That's amazing. And what's coming up next for you? Oh, uh, the next project. So I have, uh, um, I guess I will talk about my personal project. I, I, I've been <laughs> working on, uh, so it will be immersive and a setup and a dome also. It's a, it's called uh, Angstrom. So it would be, it's a quantum tale. So I will be mixing like like symbolism, uh, my own uh, weird uh, mythology. What what would be uh, a world like um, inside the the subatomic realm? But it will look something in between, like ancient Greece and uh, and like Dave McKean visuals and glitch art and a little science. So it will be a lot of a lot of everything, but uh, some some theme I really like. And, and I will try to push um, uh, the narrative on this piece uh, to to a next uh, next step. Something I need to work on. And um, and also I would like to yeah this is something we all we've all been working even like Sergey cut uh, his piece to to match the nine eight to nine minutes. It's really common to have like four to nine minutes in in full dome, maybe because of rendering times, because of uh, showing times. But uh, I think the future of immersive pieces and even full dome, we should we should aim to maybe 30 to 40 minutes, and and one day maybe we'll, we can also work on like full length movie. But I think pushing the length is uh, is something something would be would be a big uh, be, would be beneficial to the to the format at the end, even for immersive uh, installations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes it's it's too short, like. Um, most of the pieces you you wish you could dive into the pieces like longer, yeah. Amazing. So if you want to follow more of Sebastian's work, make sure you. I don't even know which direction I'm pointing in. <laughs> Somewhere, yes. some direction that I am pointing fingers in is going to be one. a chat. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be a chat, and, it, it, and we got the links in there. Um, so make sure you follow Sebastian on Instagram. Um, and Thank you. I'm going to put a couple more links up in the chat. Which first of all, uh, the Sat wonderful place. Uh, thank you to the SAT for putting on SATFest because that's what brought everybody together for uh, a lovely, lovely event. Um, and as Vincent was mentioning in the chat earlier, the SAT is getting back up and running after the pandemic stuff. So they're going to have a lot of really cool things and they do a lot of residency programs for artists. So make sure you check out their website um, and see what they're up to as well. And then the final thing is, I know we're a little bit over time, but the, my final thing is my tip to myself would be I should have joined the HQ Pro earlier, you know, like, it, it, which is a little bit of a bias because it didn't exist, you know, but now it exists now. But this, if it existed when it passed, I would say you should join the HQ Pro. Now, if you don't know what the HQ Pro is, it's our subscription kind of online school where you can learn kind of really everything and anything deep, in, deep diving into the interactive immersive industry. We have over 120 hours of courses now, touching a lot of Unreal, um, kind of Ableton notch on uh, touch designer on real life. There's so many words. <laughs> There's so many words. <laughs> There's a lot of words and we're expanding into a lot more creative courses as well. So we just uploaded uh, a really amazing course. That's a creative introduction to audio concepts. So that's a really fun one. Um, and we also have a lot of kind of really fun activities that we do with our members. Like Mason was saying earlier, every two weeks, we have a group session where we're kind of doing like a, a live Q and a kind of in a zoom like this. And there's a lot more stuff. I don't need to tell you every single detail, but what I'm going to do is put a link in the chat for you. That's going to tell you a little bit more about the HQ Pro. And the only reason I'm bringing that up is because next week we are starting a 50% off promotion. So if you wanted to take a look, but you were like, oh, you know, it was a little bit out of my price range before, uh, for the next week, it's going to be 50% off your first month. So perfect time to dive in and there's no real commitment. So you can join for the month and then afterwards say, you know what? Thanks for everything. We're going to move on, but that is your prerogative. So let me put the, there's a, another link in the chat is coming is the link to get the 50% off. Cause you guys have a little special treat, which it doesn't start till Sunday, but you can even like, you can hop in now. This, that's why there's a secondary special link. So that is in the chat now as well. And then the final thing, Oh, the sats Instagram I got here. Uh, let me put that in the chat. I mean, you know, where's this good? The chat's going to be more links than, than anything else, but with that said, thank you everybody for joining us. So a big um, round of applause for our artists. All of your works were really amazing. It was a lot of fun for me to kind of watch the different trailers and pieces and then kind of put together how we were gonna talk about all of them. Um, thank you to the, the folks in the chat and the viewers for watching. A lot of fun to see everybody again. 
Uh, we haven't done a live stream in a little bit, but we're going to start doing uh, more of them coming soon. So make sure you hit the the appropriate platform symbolism of following. I don't you know. Sometimes it's a like. Sometimes it's a love. Sometimes it's a follow. I don't even know half the what the buttons are, uh, but whichever one it is, make sure you hit it. Uh, oh, and thank you, Sat. Sat is in the chat. Thank you, Sat, for putting the Instagram down there. Let me throw it back here as well. I think I copied and pasted in my rush. I copied and pasted the wrong <laughs> link. So with that said, thank you, everybody, for joining us, and we'll see you in the next live stream. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.